Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. It might be hard to believe, but migraine is one of the leading causes of disability in the world, with around a billion people suffering from them. But there is hope. Scientists at Queensland University of Technology are involved in the world's biggest migraine study and are trying to determine which genes play a role in the disorder to help develop treatments. Joining us now is Professor Lynn Griffiths, a molecular geneticist who is the executive director of the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation from QUT. Welcome, Lynn. Hi, Paul. Now, firstly, do you know why so many people suffer from migraine disorder and can it be inherited? So migraine is a very common neurological disorder. In fact, it's the most common neurological disorder in the world. Why is it so common? Well, yes, it does have a very significant genetic component. So it runs through families. And in fact, what you'll do is you'll find probably 90% of migraine sufferers have another close relative who suffers from the disorder. Probably about 50% uh, of the time, it'll be one of the parents. So it's a very strongly genetic disorder, runs through families, also doesn't affect mortality. So even though you suffer from it, it doesn't actually reduce your lifespan. And so that's why it's kept in the population and it, and it continues through families. And if you don't mind me asking, I understand that you have your own family history uh, to do with, with migraines. And is that what sort of led you into research, researching the, the problem in the first place? Yeah, I'm a geneticist, so I was interested in trying to find genes that play a role in disorders. And I was working on neurological disorders and then started to go to more complex ones. There are rare neurological disorders caused by single genes, but it turned out that some of the studies I was doing made me believe that some of those single gene disorders were in fact due to multiple genes. And so it made me start thinking you could look at other sorts of disorders, uh, more complex ones that involve multiple genes. And uh, yes, because I suffered from migraine, my mum had suffered from migraine and when my son was about four he started suffering really badly from migraine as well so that made me start to think somebody really ought to be looking at this as a genetic disease because it's pretty obvious that it runs through families so this was way mm. back in the 1990s I started working on migraine there were probably a number of people working on migraine but not from a genetics point of view then so we were probably one of the first groups in the world to start looking at it from that point of view and started a, a number of genetic studies on migraine. Now, a bit like getting confused between the common cold and having the flu, I think people might um, not understand necessarily the difference between uh, a common headache and a migraine. What are the symptoms and how do you know if you, you're having a migraine? Well, obviously a migraine has involved some head pain, but it has a number of other uh, symptoms as well. The head pain for a start is very severe. It can go from between four hours and up to 72 hours. So you can have migraine for days. And it's not just that head pain, you have uh, nausea and vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia, you can't stand bright lights and loud noise. You have an aversion to physical activity because you're in a lot of pain. And also it's uh, the pain tends to be throbbing and pulsating and usually one side of the head. All of those are symptoms of migraine not just headache. Headache is when you just have a sore head. There's no necessarily specific triggers for migraine and it's, and, it's, and it's also episodic. It's something that if you get it once, it will come back again at different stages. Hard to predict when you're actually going to get it as well. Um, and I suppose the other thing is all those symptoms I described are common to the two main types of migraine, migraine with and without aura. But in addition, those who suffer from migraine with aura have a number of uh, neurological disturbances that occur either just before the head pain starts or in the early stages. And these disturbances tend to be uh, visual. So you have you know, wavy lines, blurred vision, tunnel vision, even complete loss of vision. You can have weakness through parts of your body. You'll have trouble speaking normally. All sorts of strange neurological things that occur are part of what this, what's called the aura that you get with migraine. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask for clarification of the aura. So it, it ends up being something sort of visual or something you, you just sort of feel a bit odd. Well, you definitely feel a bit odd. It can be so odd that you can actually lose your eyesight. You can also get so weak that you can get it right through one half of your body so that it, it actually doesn't move normally. And, and a lot of people have trouble speaking normally. So these are neurological disturbances that occur in the early stages of migraine. There are some types of migraine with aurea that are much more severe than that as well. So not only the head pain and all those things I've mentioned, but I've mentioned uh, paralysis. So some 
sometimes that can be extended. It can actually go on for months. People can get a coma and the coma can go on for months. In some cases, it's, it's even um, very rarely, but sometimes it's actually lethal as well. This is one particular type of migraine with aura. So it's not just a headache. <laughs> it actually can be yeah. much worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really awful. You mentioned that it, uh, there's no clear trigger for migraines. Uh, in individual studies, has there been any sort of, um, you know, uh, indication of for an individual whether there are certain things that, that can lead into migraines, not necessarily applicable to everyone, but say diet or other things like that that can affect it? So what we find now is that we believe that migraine has a genetic basis and for those with that genetic basis, they're susceptible to changes in their environment or triggers that can bring on the migraine attack. And those triggers, well, there's, there's quite a, a, a large number of them and different triggers for different people. So it could be certain types of food. It's usually really good ones like changes in your coffee levels, uh, chocolate, ripe wine, nice cheeses. So the good things in life can quite often in some people trigger it. Sometimes it's things like strong smells, like strong perfumes can trigger a migraine attack in some people. Sometimes it's a barometric pressure changes. So just before a storm's going to come, the world feels a bit different. But people who suffer from migraine, that can actually be a trigger uh, for their migraine. Sometimes it's changes in stress levels. Uh, it could be too much stress or what's worse is going on a holiday and then finding you get a migraine. So sometimes there are specific triggers for specific people and it can be really important to keep a diary of what has been a trigger that might have brought on your migraine so that you know what to watch out for in the future. Yeah, that's it's fascinating. And then research looking at, uh, you know, there are dozens of genetic risk factors for migraine. How do those findings help develop treatments? So in actual fact, there are quite a number of genetic risk factors that have been identified for migraine and we keep identifying more of those as we study more people. And there's two different types of those. Some of these are risk factors, meaning if you have that genetic variation, you have an increased risk of having migraine. And those are the ones that you find with the very common types of migraine. There are some though that are, are worse than that. So there are some that are what's called causative. So, and they're mutations in specific genes. And if you have those mutations, it actually causes that type of migraine. So I mentioned one before where you have uh, paralysis down half of your body. Um, you also can go into a coma that can quite often be extended and you have very severe migraine as well. These are inherited dominantly through families if you have it. All of your children have a 50% chance of having it. They, they also tend to have an early age of onset. Quite often you'll find children who actually have this as well. And this particular type of one is due to specific genes that cause it, not just increase your risk, they cause it. And it's good to actually know about those because if you know which particular causative mutation you have in your family, you can define what's an appropriate treatment for those. So a number of these rare types of migraine with aura, we currently do all the diagnostic testing for all of Australia and New Zealand for these types of migraine, and also for some related conditions that are also caused by other genes. They're not migraine, but migraine is one of the symptoms associated with it. So if you can define which particular gene you have mutated, then you can also define what's the most appropriate treatment for you. So for the, the known ones that we currently do diagnostics for, there are some very good treatments when you know which specific gene it is, and it's a different treatment depending upon which gene it is. For the more common types of migraine, we haven't got all of those genes yet, so there's a bit more work that we need to do to actually identify the genes uh, that play into this so that we can develop some new treatments. Just finally, Lynn, then, do you have any advice for anyone who's watching at the moment who is themselves a migraine sufferer? I think the most important thing to think about with migraine is that it's important for you to think about your migraine, to try and identify the triggers that might actually be causing migraine in your case. Uh, so there could be certain types of food or pressure changes or uh, perfumes, etc. Try and identify those through something like a diary. The second thing is if you have tried some treatments and maybe they're not so effective, it's really important to look around because there are some incredibly good treatments for migraine and if one didn't work for you, it's quite possible another one would. So make sure that you talk to your GP, make sure that you talk to your neurologist and work out what's best for you and also what might be better for your family as they may develop migraine as well. 
Well, Lynn, congratulations on the work that you're doing. Good luck uh, on behalf of all the migraine sufferers uh, out there, and uh, thank you very much for your time.